Lord, how am I alive? So I'm joined by Craig Mollett, Emmett Lewis, and Frederick Beck. So, flexibility, what's that all about? <laughs> the Emily first time. <laughs> <laughs> and go. Oh, that she's off with flexibility. No, nah, I'm just uh, saying. <laughs> we can. Let's yeah. talk about. Us. What do we talk about? What were we just talking about? We were talking about pubic bone. Getting punched shots. in the pubic bone, apparently. <laughs> you have to be very flexible. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of actually which, I have a flexibility cheat code involving the pubic bone. Mm-hmm. Where if you friction the top side of your pubic bone while you're back bending, for those who don't know, friction is uh, making contact with the bone surface and then going side to side on top of it, sink in a little, and then do a bridge or back bend afterwards. It should do something, it'll either make you go deeper or change the sensation. Do you so do it with like a gosha or something? Okay. Probably a Any other No, generally it's just like. Or demoing on Fred here, but just just rubbing it doesn't need to be hard. Just rub off the bone. Cheat codes. Is that just like a distraction thing, or is there like? Yeah, it's basically just changes. It's like is that the uh, part of one of the, the front line and just diverges at there. So when you back bend, if you change the sensation at the sort of tendon junction, it kind of does something at the rectus abdominis. Nice. Yeah. There you go. If anyone wants me to rub the pubic bone, I'll demonstrate. <laughs> or is this live? Does <laughs> everyone get their pubic bone rubbed away? <laughs> is this what Fanny was posting? This is why you earned the reputation of the splits guru. Ah. Though I haven't got that reputation, I have a splits hobo at the moment. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm liking that one. A splits hobo is a fair, uh, <laughs> fair one. It's a fair assessment of the situation. <laughs> like you got a solid beard, it's like a few more feet to get to wizard, but at the moment it's like perfect yeah. hobo. <laughs> Cruising through the wizard, I'm getting there. <laughs> no one's got me my staff yet. I'm feeling a bit let down. Get yeah, a staff with a good shot at the end. I saw the staff earlier. Yeah, that's the blackthorn one I was talking about. It's not really a staff, it's more a pump. Oh, that's, yeah. stick. <laughs> that's a beaten stick. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was saying to Fred, like, blackthorn's mad. It takes like two, three years just to get it ready to start working on. Can we take it off the wall? We found that place down in, in Shillelagh. That's yeah, where I actually well. got that stick. The guy's yeah. a really the good stick maker. Yeah. Yeah, it's very like touristy, but he does make a good stick. Yeah, I've been looking at that once for quite some time, going like, mm, that one's not right, this one's not right. Just ask him to make you one. Yeah. yeah. No, I just, I'm just going by the pure aesthetics of it. I'm sure in terms of like purposes of home defense. Doing stuff. Home <laughs> defense. I'm whacking you. Whacking you get that one. Whacking stick. Fred is now proceeding to grab the stick. For those of you listening well, who don't know. Probably easiest to just grab it from the top of the stairs. So a shillelagh is a lead-loaded stick we have in Ireland made of black thorn. That is. Yeah. So we had a thing called the penal laws, which basically the British outlawing the possession or use of weapons in Ireland. Um, so people went through a long spate of a few hundred years of perfecting whacking S- sticks. Stick beating. It's a walking stick. Yeah. You wouldn't deprive a man of a stick. And so uh, it's weighed with lead somewhere? This yeah, one isn't. That's just oh. a, a standard one. Normally what they do is they drill a hole through the back of here and fill it full of lead. And then you put a band around it like you would on a hurl. Okay. And then like some lead in the bottom so it wouldn't be like super top heavy. Thing is like blackthorn can take an insane okay. amount of wax. You actually see like there's a divot in the top there where I hit yeah. like a steel plate with a rivet in it. That one there. And it's just like the whole stick. Like Who was wearing the steel plate? Um well it was like a actually a shield <laughs> dude had. And it was like a steel plate on it. And like the whole thing bent like forty five degrees back on itself and just straightened back out. Nice. Um, so the thing is it takes like two years to dry it out and then you're going to soak it in oil for a week and then shape it to what you want but they're absolute they're horrible things to work with because you see all like those lumps or yeah. the, the thorns on them they're kind of some of the features of it though it's like I might miss with the heavy end but you're going to get stabbed with the torn bits <laughs> <laughs> I've seen some people who finish them and leave the thorns on yeah we've got that a couple like that yeah I imagine they're uh, I can't imagine the most useful thing for walking around with I think that's the point. He used to carry his when he was walking the dog in case another dog bit his dog. <laughs> <laughs> that one's a bit short for walking around with, in fairness, but it is a... Uh, is it a fighting stick? or Yeah, it's more just for whacking stuff. Hence the, uh, yeah, the leather cord around the handle. We were like, the history of the faction fights. Did you ever read any of that? Oh, a lot of it, too. It's like, we used to have, like, basic gang fights, organised gang fights. <coughs> and I don't know they'd have, like... They'd meet up at different festivals and fairs, and they'd they'd have like they'd have basically a contract, a verbal contract, on what you could or couldn't do in the fight. Mm. You know, could you kick someone on the ground? If someone's down, did you have to help them up? What size stick you're allowed? If you're allowed dual wield, or only allowed one? Mm. 
if you could fight women or not like all this stuff would come in I think you hear it mentioned in Finnegan's Week they talk about Shillelagh Law yeah like Shillelagh Law was all the rage I think all of this um, yeah I think the biggest one that ever happened was somewhere in Kerry yeah. at like a race day and like 2,000 people took part <laughs> good few people were killed and if I remember rightly a police officer was beheaded <laughs> <laughs> sounds about right yeah was a stick mental. I mean that's like the term Donnybrook comes from the the Donnybrook yeah. uh, cattle fair and just all the fights that used to break out of that so funny now Donnybrook's like the posh is here you go yeah. the closest thing you have to faction yeah. fight is Wesley which it's is like synonymous disco. with fights <laughs> have a Donnybrook Let's have a Donnybrook boys heavy yeah. <clears throat> sounds like you go drink Heineken <laughs> I mean it's a nice like as a wood I really like it it's just really not even awkward to get it's just more awkward to find nowadays so everyone chops it back is it straightened like I know no that's that, that's a whole branch so that's like the root bulb and it grows up and out like that uh, okay. the chop here so you can see like that would have been another branch uh, okay there. cool some people will grow like a branch and then like as the branches come off so the cop is one end and the branches will go straight but then, like you get those weird ones that are like a, you see the real touristy ones where it looks like a square, like block on the end yeah, of it yeah. almost. Yeah. Which that's just aesthetically, I don't like the look of. But that's just for tourists. Yeah. Like the wall, it's like as a walking stick. Mm. It's quite comfortable to have this in your hand. But that's why you, you need a you know walking stick. You can point the stuff with your hand, you mm. point in the distance and talk about. <coughs> you know, yeah, very important. There you go. Over here. Over that way. Look like, what you're doing this way. These guys know I've been very fond of my log been training with recently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Special log training. Yeah, it's like um, about eyebrow height. It's probably 10 centimeters in diameter and it's seven or eight kilos and I throw it around and juggle it for strength training. I know um, there's a guy, Sarah Libero, he's like a, a famous jiu-jitsu guy. And he got mad into training with a, like a drain pipe half filled with water. The slosh pipe. Yeah. So I remember like, Dan John does an article on T Nation maybe 2000 2001 talking about the slosh pipe he's just like buy some 4 inch pipes so a 10 centimetre pipe fill it with water put some caps on it slosh pipe basically but then I was in Roman Palace at the gym recently doing a workshop and he had like someone had made a slosh pipe brand slosh pipe <laughs> <laughs> and he had 4 or 5 different sizes with like fabric handles and everything I'm just like kind of missing the point when you have like easy to grip handles on this yeah. and <laughs> fancy coloured fluids in it <laughs> yeah, it's like it's also the reason why it's such a practical thing because you buy it for five quid in a hardware store yeah. <laughs> damn fitness industry you can brand name it and sell it for three hundred dollars though oh no much Roman it. paid for it Roman why do you buy so many gimmicks and well I did see a place selling like travel parallels that were just like PVC pipe parallels for a hundred quid yeah I was just like what the fuck it's BBC pipe. Yeah. Well, you can buy the sandbags as well with handles. Mm. It's like, eh. Buy my easy to lift sandbag. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I don't get the grip strength that I need. That's the whole point of sandbag training, just defeated from. It's like yeah. those sandbag discs. They're kind of. I hope Andy's not listening. They're kind of pointless. Yeah. Those are kind of like frisbees. I don't think Andy really uses the sandbags. Yeah, I know. Every gym I know that had them. Like, when yeah. I worked in gym box, they had, I don't know, maybe 50 of them in most of the gyms of just varying sizes with a special rack for them. And I think I used them for stretching. It was about the only time I got. They're actually okay for that because it's kind of like a weight that drapes on you. And the knee land is easy yeah. for Yeah, and it deforms it's a little bit. bit. Yeah, other than that, it's just like, <laughs> what's the point? You wonder how expensive that was. It's a custom rack for them. Yeah, yeah, they're well. fucking expensive as well. 1500 grade or something for a sandbag rack. But they look good. It's true. They're functional training, bro. Dysfunctional training. That's what I want to start doing. So, Craig, mm. more question here. have you developed the freaky fascia from the log training yet? Um, that's a good question. I think it's getting there. <coughs> the back, uh, it started off uh, that it was all shoulders. And that lasted about two weeks, and now it's just in the lower back, just like... Oh, yeah. Every time I... And it's interesting to do. I do like a six or seven minute non-stop juggling kind of set. And, uh, yeah, it's interesting to get to the end of that and have like mid to lower back doms <laughs> from it. So I kind of want to get it to give me like calf gains or, or ankle gains or something like that. Yeah. Get it all the way down the body. <laughs> 
So. Get fat around bits mm-hmm. from it. Another question for Greg. Do you believe <laughs> that the uh, the armpit gain is possible for your guar? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Can, how buff can we make our guar? So if anyone doesn't know what a guar is, well, I'll let you explain it. It's the, the crease that is between the torso and the, any of the limbs. So you've got them roughly follows the inguinal canal on the on the hips and it's between the shoulder and the uh, pec on the upper body so you've got four and there are these creases where the torso meets the limb and uh, we did a lot of work on the lower body one in the workshop and it, everyone could feel where their gua was and I was uh, talking about possibly making them unreasonably jacked jacked gua jacked should be gua. a challenge to get like your gua to pop out yeah. But without gaining 20 kilos. <laughs> <laughs> and without having hernia. Without getting no. a foot. <coughs> hernia doesn't count. That's not a jack squat. That's a broken squat. <laughs> oh, no. Hernia gains <laughs> in your squat. Check out my gains. I remember seeing a video of one guy. It's questionable to this point, but he had control over it. Who had something sticking out his yellow cord that he developed from some kind of Qigong. Mm-hmm. It looked like a hernia, but he could move it around. Mm. Like, like it's just like he was kind of shredded, this guy, for Qigong guy as well. Like, full six-pack. It was like, just in the Linnea Alba, just this little thing sticking out, like a finger behind it, that could move whichever direction he wanted. It's kind I was of just like, have you got, like, ultimate hernia control? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or did you actually, like, do something strange? Has he, like, gotten up serious hernia and then developed, like, vacuum control? Yeah. And yeah. To move it? It's possible. Possible, Craig. I want to see you like move your gua, rippling gua, and just like standing <laughs> postures. Is that sounds like a great band name, the yep. rippling gua. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll start training and get back to you. Yeah. Jacked guas. <laughs> the jacked guas. I am on. Speaking of strange missions, I am on a mission to get a, um, some serious. Brachiation powers and it's it's coming along well. Uh, starting to get some like one arm airtime, <coughs> and uh, like it's basically no strain on the shoulder at all anymore, which is nice. I saw a really interesting thing someone did a while back about like a comparison between gibbon brachiation and human mm-hmm. brachiation, where like their shoulder girdle is like the closest in any ape to ours. And they're saying that like potentially if you were to scale it up with what they can do to what we can do. Mm-hmm. That like a human could potentially hit like thirty kilometers an hour at break eighty. Yeah, I wouldn't. <laughs> Which is wouldn't uh, I put put that past the realm of possibility. <laughs> I just imagine like people swinging down the street like thirty miles <laughs> thirty kilometers an hour. Just, ah, so we need yeah. to <laughs> replace pavements with monkey bars. <laughs> There's a uh, every time you've got one of those like closed in, whole like pedestrian footpaths where they're working on a building site, and you've got the bottom of the the um, scaffolding. They're usually like the perfect distance, but you need a decent uh, like one arm release and catch to actually make it. But it's usually long enough about the only place in the whole world where it's long enough to do a more than like one, two, three, and then come down and go for a couple of minutes. Yes. There was a good one in San Fran that uh, I was kind of tempted by, it, but it was in the streets and it was kind of full of hobos and gangsters and guys with boom boxes and stuff so I decided not to you should have struck them with the weirdos <laughs> yeah. San Francisco no one would have battled them yeah, yeah I really don't think they'd mind just drop trail put on some leather pants <laughs> fit in with the scenery have you seen the pants poop, what the, uh, about? the poop app for San Francisco yeah <clears throat> so real. they have like an app that will show you where the most human poops in the city are and it's like updated daily as to like where people have been shitting on the street <laughs> real time <laughs> 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 you gotta log in. Take it. <laughs> Thank you, power user. <laughs> <laughs> You've uploaded your third picture today. <laughs> Congratulations, you have unlocked Penta Juice. <laughs> we have more important questions for the good doctor about how to get completely massive and flexible. Yeah, tell us how you do it, Fred. <laughs> What's your secret? I don't think there is a secret. But from the <laughs> I think the secret is consistency. I think the secret is consistency. Um, That's not yeah, what we want to hear. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think it's. I think it's more like a cultural thing, like, and the people who tend to be flexible, or interested in being flexible, are uninterested in being strong. Yeah. And then the reverse is also true: the people who are focused on strength training 
don't do anything for flexibility training more as an afterthought like doing 30 seconds of trying to touch the toes at the end of yeah. the training session which is not really and it's it's usually like the just kind of static stretching not actually doing anything a position if anything yeah. so it's just kind of this stupid conversation between two groups that are kind of wedded to a particular ideal it is starting to break up a little bit now but it's there's still there's a lot of middle ground that isn't being occupied yeah. and like there's definitely a case to be made for say if you're a power lifter then you probably shouldn't push too hard towards flexibility training because then you get more range of motion that you don't actually want because you want that soft tissue bounce and just clear parallel and just like then you're tight and you bounce up it as a power yeah one of the power lifters um, describes how the deep joint can squat He's like, I want to be able to squat one inch above parallel unweighted. Yes. <laughs> and then the weight will push me below parallel. <laughs> the weight will do the rest. Yeah. So there's definitely something to that. Um, but if you're not a power lifter that's competitive, then maybe you do want to be able to squat to ass to grass. Yeah, you're not and a power lifter if you haven't stepped on a platform. Controversial. <sighs> yeah. Do you even belt? <laughs> <laughs> do you even knee sleeves, bra? <laughs> So yeah, like especially if you can't, like if you're squatting but you can't actually touch your toes, you can't actually squat, do a body weight squat, you actually need the weight to push you down into the position, then maybe there's something to be said there. And if you're doing yoga and you've been doing yoga for 20 years and you're just kind of limb and you don't actually have control over your range of motion, maybe you want to do more strength training. But then those people probably aren't listening to what we're saying at the moment. Just How's your yoga market reach? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you need to tap into those yoga dollars. It's true. It's hilarious. Like, whenever you put hashtag yoga on Instagram, immediately like, the bump on your post goes way up. Yeah. Although, did anyone see it? I think it was DK Movement. I put up a post during the week of like how he, four years ago, he was doing yoga and was like really unhappy, was really thin, was vegan, wasn't like content with it. And then just started doing movement training and eating red meat again and the wall of hate that he got sent on Instagram oh. was insane pull him up I'm going to pull this up and I'll read some of the choice comments <laughs> it <laughs> is find this like hilarious out. myself um, but I just remember looking at it it's like all these people who like their profiles are like oh DK peace love movement. and care I think it's the one I'll check it Devin it. Kelly follow up with Freeman Fitness yeah there you go could well be him oh yeah it's a before and after yeah it's a before and after one pretty skinny left 2014 physical practice yoga salad vegetarian vegan weight 65 kg pain patology shoulder basically everything is fucked six five day time yeah. hairstyle mangled dead rodent <laughs> <laughs> i can't argue with that it's good style right physical practice progress moving calisthenics gymnastics climbing dance blah 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 meat centered including every major food group excluding gluten soy blah 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 the usual weight 80 kg pain patology is none recent Ill illness hairstyle Acceptably kempt, but not trying too hard. <laughs> Comment. Here you go. He's just thrown the... Russell the jimmies. All right, let's see how many triggered yogis come hissing out of the cracks. <laughs> 524 comments. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we begin? <laughs> this is uh, one of those things I always find like very interesting. It's like, Let's face it, everyone on Instagram is where they're taking a shit. Yeah. And there's someone like, instead of just enjoying taking a dump, has read this post and gone... Hold on, <laughs> I'm gonna sit here longer. I need to reply angrily. That's not how you take a shit. This is how you take a shit. Yeah, it's always when you see this wall of text and it actually fills out the whole screen. And it's like that person clearly hit the limit for how long the comment could be, mm. and then posted it, and then went on writing mm -hmm. afterwards again. Mm. Once you get a little bit down, you'll start to see that oh, you're a murderer. Comments. Murderer. See, the problem is ever sort of liking the comments now. The yeah, they. The more interesting ones did bump up to the top, but if you scroll down, you'll see the, the wall of hate that got put towards them. That's the wall of hate. Dun, dun, dun. No, that's people basically agree with them. Echo chamber. Echo chamber. Let's go down further. Come on, give me the hate. This would be really disappointing if you get through the whole thing and there's not actually any hate posts. <laughs> it's all since been deleted. Yeah. Well, there is what like five hundred comments on it now, because I just kept seeing like other people reposting on their stories, being like, "Oh, I should drop over and have a look at this." 
but it's funny for like groups of people who are meant to be so loving and caring just commenting on like you're a murderer how could you abide by the torture of living creatures well, come on give me some help <clears throat> I want to see these people was trolling the vegans in the comments here. <laughs> Maybe carnivores need to learn a lesson from this. <laughs> oh, that was eagerly away. Come on, don't leave us hanging. Honestly, it's just support. Yeah, it's probably there. The, you go. There you go. It's kind of ruining the podcast now. We're going to give us the hate. Prove our biases wrong that yogis are all hate filled. And really, they're all just about the hot abs. <laughs> <laughs> yoga pants yoga little lemon in the sunset yeah yoga's weird in some regards like well <coughs> not in some regards in many regards <coughs> like any practice that makes you happy I'm all for doing it but at the same time it's the weird cultishness that comes with it really kind of just blows my mind yeah then maybe cults make you happy <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, give you a sense of purpose and yeah. community. I'm, I'm growing my beard. I'm going full Osho mode in a few years. <laughs> Not lying, you know. Fuck it. You need a longer staff, though. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. Like the scalp, as the beard gets longer, the staff will disappear one day. <laughs> <laughs> I've reached it. And then you'll get robes. Uh, see, that's one of the just one of the comments that came up on mine. Looking at it was a. Uh, if you're getting injured from doing asanas, then clearly you're doing the practice wrong funny because I know a lot of yogis who get injured from asana yep no, I'm sure they probably are also doing the practice wrong but maybe just maybe well if you're doing it wrong then who's... it's the level of teaching yeah mm. it's kind of it's one of those things I remember I was at Famcon and I was doing a lecture so they asked me to do a lecture but didn't say what topic so I went in and said oh let's speak to the group of 10, 12, 2 people who showed up we talked a lot about the scene everything else but one of the things came up on just like yoga where I was like saying like maybe movement as a thing needs a kind of a centralized body who can give the stamp to the teacher saying you know I'm not saying you take over but go like okay this person has if we look at what a generic movement teacher at the moment nowadays has is like oh, I stopped doing CrossFit and then I took up movement and I've done a few workshops and now I'm a movement teacher for me that's not really an education whereas if you look at yoga they have you know well, I was using an example they have like okay we have our 200 hour courses and our 500 hour courses mm. which is a more realistic time frame of education to actually come out and say I can teach something which is still still not great but it's kind of like it's the initial training phase of what should be your apprenticeship basically you do okay 500 hours of theory blah 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 and then you do an apprenticeship and then you become a teacher something like this but then I use the yoga thing and there's a couple of yogis in the room who are just hissing at me going like we love yoga no they just they just want your yoga money they're fucking terrible they just pass everything so I was like alright maybe the quality control in this idea mm. isn't so good so here's the, the classic yoga comment that I came across uh, all in your perception and your mind you have to attune your beliefs a plant based diet is superior for longevity and human health a uh, plant based diet is sustainably the future sustainable for the future of the planet simply scientifically proven uh, go watch bloody bloody blah loads of random Documentaries, uh, all vegan, pound for pound, the best in speciality. Uh, reading this post has propelled me to start practicing handstand push ups and pull ups just to prove that I can bring the facts to the table. Uh, progress picture and egocentric pic coming soon. Compassion over ego. Lots of random love hearts. It's just kind of shit. It's just like, yes, if one diet works for you, that's great. Maybe it doesn't work for everyone. Yeah. It's also this kind of thing is like, vegan diet for the planet. Yes, I agree. It probably could be fine, but. How about we smash all our industry and shipping industry before we do that? Mm. If you bought nothing that was shipped to your country, nothing, just bought all local. If you couldn't get it, you know, fuck your iPhones, fuck your laptops, fuck your electronics, fuck your shoes. Then, if you look at the amount of pollution the shipping industry outputs, mm. we could reduce that 20%. Well, I mean, my good buddy Luke, who I kind of co, like he looks after the nutrition side of what I do. Yeah. Like he's a professional chef and he's always like, okay, here's the foods you shouldn't eat purely for moral reasons. And it's a lot of them are the ones that vegans and vegetarians go mad for. Like quinoa is one you really shouldn't eat because the people who grow it now can't eat it and that's their staple food. Yeah. And we're slowly forcing areas of the world into famine because it's the trendy cool food to eat that you want in your salad bowl. 
Yeah, I always never sat well with this idea of the foods or commodities. It's like, oh, we have a bulk commodity price for this that people produce, mm. and it's traded as a future. Yeah. I think the future is like, don't get me wrong, I'm not a smash the system thing. There's definitely benefits being able to like pre-sell your crop throughout the year and go, okay, I'll blah, blah, blah. But then it's also just like, hmm, hold on, I can never deal the crop, I can never have it in my warehouse, but I can freely trade this and just yeah, make bulk cash by I playing mean, a game. If we saw anything, the 1840s and 50s in Ireland, I mean, free market capitalism and crops were just grow perfectly. <laughs> it worked perfectly. It's just the English, they stole the potatoes. <laughs> Cross you English, you got potatoes back. So Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I like the idea of Northern Ireland exit. Northern Ireland will exit out of the United Brexit. Kingdom. They will Come back. exit the Brexit. They'll exit Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> I love it if Northern Ireland just formed their own independent country. Yeah, it's just one of those things like we have the prophecy of people who don't watch Star Trek. It's true. There's a prophecy 2024 or 2026. Northern Ireland joined back to Ireland. That episode was banned in the UK. He just promoted it. Mm-hmm. But, you know, let's face it, William Shatner. <laughs> Counting close. Yeah. Have you ever seen the Captain Planet episode where they uh, go to Northern Ireland? <laughs> it's brilliant. They so. stop like a nuclear bomb threat. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to use this nuke on Northern Ireland. <laughs> Which bit? No. All of it. <laughs> Won't that get us too? There's, there's a surprising amount of like uh, accurate level prediction coming from various comics and cartoons and movies and stuff. <laughs> this is true. The Simpsons have nailed even, a lot over yeah, the past yeah. few years. The one with Trump going down the elevator, waving in the particular yeah, way with the signs, yeah, yeah. is pretty good. <laughs> and that he'd get to be president. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I like his prediction. Like, there's some newspaper back in uh, 98, 99, something like that. He's like, yeah, I'll be president someday. And I go, oh, run as a Democrat. I was like, no, I'll run as a Republican. They're stupid as shit and they'll believe anything and just suck it up. What does he do? <laughs> he might be a genius. Yeah, I think Trump is smarter than people give him credit for. It's like George Bush. Yeah. Like, our Bush 2, not Bush 1. Like, he acted like a bit of a buffoon in public, but it was just pretty much staged. Like, mm. you have to, like, just to basically survive all the backstabbing that goes on in politics. You have to be fucking tuned in to a certain degree. You can't just. It's uh, the idiot savant. Like they're all really smart in the ways they need to be. They might be socially a bit stupid, but you know they didn't get to be super rich, fucking million and billionaires out yeah. of nowhere. Like. Or just even keep the money. It's like let's yeah. face it: if you have money and you're a bit dumb, there's plenty of people out there who will help you spend it. Oh yeah. I mean, I'll do it. <laughs> like, getting the money is sometimes not too much of a problem. It's keeping it be uh, the difficult bit <laughs> I'm really trying not to say the, uh, the P word about hand sounds <laughs> <laughs> say it say it <laughs> it's a symbol of the what do you even touch on that one <laughs> so eternal Chinese martial arts is the, the way forward <laughs> it's, it's going to come back, back into a you can see it's already leaked all through Fighting Monkey and, and it's already in Vogue. It's just I hope don't it does know come the source Vogue is because like. uh, because you know I could use really use some mm-hmm. business to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Go get Craig's tutorials. <laughs> <laughs> it's Australian dollars. It's nothing for us. Yeah, don't be put off by the dollar price. It's literally yeah. three to one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's monopoly money. It's like five quid for any of his tutorials. <laughs> it's, it's highly colourful too. The money. So <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Yeah, but it's an interesting thing just where Craig is taking the direction on these things where it's kind of this thing it's like what makes a good fighter generally is the kind of things that will make someone pretty good at most other movement generally athletic let's just put it that way just as a vague term so then you got like okay people think oh internal martial arts it's martial artsy whereas Craig is kind of taking it in the direction of like hold on I don't actually have to put the gloves on and fight mm-hmm. but I can train and still do stuff the doing stuff is the important side because a lot of people train the shit and then don't do stuff mm-hmm. but it's yeah. what, what I said to Craig in our podcast a few hours ago that it's like the, the martial arts I think as one of the dog brother guys says it's the people train martial arts but a lot of people train martial arts and crafts they don't train, <laughs> <laughs> they don't train the actual 
reasoning behind it. Yeah. They just do stuff that looks fancy rather than any sort of intent or purpose to it. Some of the, the like, as far as, like, generic movement quality goes, some of the martial artists still far outweigh even the best of all the movement community. Oh, yeah. It's the same with the dancers, too. Like, oh, b-boys who fucking yeah. shit on most people. Mm-hmm. What's his name? There's some guy, Bjarte? I don't know. B-J-A-R-T-E, so correct me on how it's named. But he's found he was martial artist. He went to somewhere in China to train at a pretty good, decent school. Came back, ditched it all, got in the movement, but loads of people were saying like he just it was like a fucking machine, like mm-hmm. could just basically do whatever he wants, and uh, all came from correct Tai Chi training. I suppose maybe you could speak a bit about what's correct in comparing martial arts training versus flapping your arms and breathing. So there's a, a certain qualities you're looking for in um, in a good internal practice that'll be universal between them all and. Uh, you've got this kind of idea of structure centered to it all and it means that uh, the body's kind of acting as one unit it's very very similar to the to the rolfing idea in that you've you've removed all the restrictions don't hit me with that element <laughs> you've, re- you've removed all the restrictions from your body and so it's uh, it's kind of acting as as one piece rather than a bunch of uh, disconnected pieces and also that it's aligned with gravity and uh, so you're not fighting the force that's always there as well and um, it's pr- once you practice this a bit yourself and get it working, it's pretty clear which people are just like kind of waving their arms randomly in the air, and which people are actually doing some sort of halfway decent practice. It, you yeah, kind of get, get an eye for it. Um, uh, a big giveaway is that a, a good internal martial artist should have every single joint articulating at any time. And so, if there's arms moving and the back isn't moving and the hips aren't moving and the knees aren't moving, then you've got to got a disconnect somewhere this happens at a much more subtle level in the more advanced people where it's like literally uh like fascial sleeves uh kind of t- moving under the skin so you've got to have a much uh, more subtle eye for seeing the you like the global you, movement yeah and doesn't start the guy we train with he you kind of move his stuff and you go like thing you're gonna put your hand on the body and then it feels like a snake if you ever held a snake like wherever you touch on his body is kind of moving in response he was getting some people to touch his spine last time he was in australia and uh um you know massage therapists and people who have good sensitivity well. touch and he was uh, articulating individual vertebrae left right up down yeah um, i had a feel of that and it was uh and if you look from the outside you see his arms move and it doesn't look like his spine move but if you touch it you feel it all <laughs> shifting like tetra shifting, yeah, yeah. yeah under, underneath the skin it's it's really interesting and so in the start, like generally you'll see the, the kind of uh, intermediate person will be making it really obvious where you've got a lot of uh, maybe uh, traction and compression or flexion and extension or anything like this um, throughout all the joints. And then as they get more refined, it gets more subtle to the point where you can really need an eye to be able to see it. But uh, you know, just, just a bit like everything, if you know, I remember when I first started stretching the holy Jesus out of my hip flexors with Kit. I walked around for a long time just seeing tight hip flexors everywhere. It became <laughs> <laughs> super obvious. So it's like, you know, whatever you're working on tends to be really clear to you and other people that it's missing usually. <laughs> and occasionally surprised by people who have it. But it's the same thing here. When you're working on these things, you start to get an eye for when it's there or not. The pattern recognition with it. Yeah. It's the interesting thing I find about like what you do is, I mean, you talk like seems to be a large focus of it is learning how to just relax the body and mm-hmm. let it just release tension. Mm-hmm. And it's like the example that I've always had given to me, which makes the most sense in my mind of like how to punch hard is that like a whip that it's not like if you just swing a whip like you would a stick, it's just gonna mm-hmm. hit someone like a piece of rope and not do anything. Yeah. It's that like relaxed and then tension at the very end to get that snap. And it seems to be like so many modern martial artists are really good at hitting really hard, but then they just carry around tension all the time. Like the amount of guys I know who have like that classic Muay Thai stance, mm-hmm. and that's just their daily stance walking around. It's the interesting thing, just on that, like I was in Thailand for just a month training one of these camps. It's like the Thai guys, they were loose, relaxed, yeah. not a lot of muscle tone. They could fuck you up. Oh, yeah. Like from nothing, power just coming from nowhere. Whereas in the Westerners who you see is like that, yeah. they get the very rigid stage where it's just, 
it's an interesting thing that like particularly with the stuff like we train with very <coughs> simple motions but you just do them to exhaustion i think the ties have a, a very clear idea of training to exhaustion that eventually this quality emerges mm. they also have the time to do it yeah like, probably i've been boxing since <laughs> four and have yeah. 400 fights yeah. <laughs> 300 k- tkos and train six hours a day <laughs> but it's it's one of the things that like i've had arguments with fucking countless fighters and just like pointed them to you know high level tie boxers and been like you know a large part of their training is play because they know that if you're trying to knock the head off your opponent every single day yeah. by the time you're 12 <laughs> you're, you're going to be useless as a fighter and it's uh, a lot of fighters here it's there's like it's either 100% or nothing there's no yeah. like in between yeah I think that was kind of with the ties there was a lot of just fooling around in the class they're also just taking the piss even when they're messing with themselves doing their own training yeah. it's just like it makes sense I suppose so I love um, Sanchai. He's like a real famous Thai boxer. But the amount of times where he like do some really mad, stupid shit, like shuffle his feet or blow kisses at his opponent, <laughs> do stuff to really wind him up. And you've seen him fight guys who are like thirty or forty pounds heavier than them and just ragdoll them like they're nothing. Nice. It's amazing to see. Like, but it's uh, yeah, I think some people get caught in the the old school mentalities. Like I've had fucking guys tell me like oh you can't lift weights because it'll slow you down and you're like people still believing that shit in 2018 mm-hmm. yeah so yeah just to go back to guys like they were all lifting weights every single now they're doing shitty isolation exercises for high reps but they're still Don't doing do bicep something. curls shoulder press you name it they were doing it lap I've raises a, I've got a friend training with me who's uh, he's training all the internal methods and lifting weights and there's no problem yeah. His structure is getting better and better every time I see him. He's getting real, more relaxed and he can chin up with 50 kilos. So, <laughs> like to me, it's if you did the two in equal amount, it's only going to benefit the other mm. one. Yeah. Much, like. This kind of goes back to Fred's example of like you have one culture that doesn't do it and they go, Oh, yeah, yeah, boxing exactly. fast and loose, powerlifting tight and strong, <clears throat> blah blah blah. And it's like, Oh, we never trained that thing, it'll make you like them. It's like, well, No. <laughs> Is this idea of structure completely absent in the West, at least in training circles? Because like mm-hmm. it is, it is like if you go read all the bodywork stuff, you look into golfing and all that came out of that. It's it is a lot of that idea. Yeah. They just went about getting that thing in a different way. So instead of training it, it was like you got the bodywork, and then hopefully the body body went like okay, what the fuck happened, and then sorts yeah. it out and goes. This is this is West. The center is. Mm-hmm. It's one of these things I've heard a few people kind of like. You gotta think in terms of the idea of structure in the martial arts is <coughs> trying to make a frame that you can do things from. Yeah. So if you listen to a lot, <coughs> some of the stuff Louis Simmons talks about. Yeah. He's building a structure for powerlifting, and mm-hmm. it's it makes sense. It's almost internal. Some of the cueing he's using. Mm-hmm. So it definitely is an idea of it, but there's no formal concept in. I suppose strength and conditioning circles in athletics you get it a little actually because they understand the slings and that kind of idea but they're still I think China kind of nailed the training methodologies but they just seem so weird and esoteric that they're a bit out there I suppose I was kind of I was chatting to you about it in the crate that like I think a lot of the not even the problem but it's just the way it's phrased within a lot of Asian disciplines is very like wrapped in riddles or like not even riddles it's stuff that in the time made sense because it was the context of the yeah. time where you'd say yeah. even like the names of a lot of the moves where it's like it made sense because that's how you'd refer to it because the farmer only knew like a crane stood in X sort of way so that's how you'd stand in that position yeah the, yeah it's uh, the, the context is definitely needing updating to the modern world and it's one of the things I'm really trying to do with my stuff is not to have to turn to terminologies and old words that generally make people angry anyway <laughs> you, know, you can you can say chi and people will lose their shit and go into arguments about what it means and so on and it really like words are just pointing to something and if you know what it's pointing you to you don't really care which word gets used and and so it i've managed to teach many many people to do things that a lot of people would call chi i don't care and i've never used the terminology and you can still teach them to do it you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a weird, like, literally 
arguing about definitions of words almost yeah. mm-hmm. that's kind of like really detracting from doing the actual training and it's also a thing that people who don't really understand uh, I, oh, I should say they don't have their own experience of what it is so um, they're relying on books and then it's a this person's description versus that person's description because they're describing an experience that's their own experience and maybe it's a little bit different people get all like mm. my chi mm. is hot my chi is cold yeah it can't be hot and cold. <laughs> My G is just right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and anyway, it's a bit like, uh, you know, why, why do we use foreign words if, if there's some perfectly good local words to use? So one of my tasks is uh, a kind of like self-given task in the world is to explain a lot of this stuff in a much clearer, more simplistic way where it's just, it's like this and this and this and I'll show you and in, even better, I'll make you do it so you don't have to believe me. <laughs> Because uh, in the end, if I say this and this can this can happen, and you go, I believe you, or I don't believe you, either one is just believing or not believing a fantasy that you don't know is real until you do it yourself. Because I might be insane, you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you might seem sane, but you'll never know. And, yeah, so it's really important to be able to give the, the direct experience. And uh, the nice thing about Serge's school is uh, I've not actually met a single person who's gone through the training who doesn't have their own experience of any of these things. So it's, it's replicatable. Mm-hmm. And, uh, replicatable and well, that, yeah. that term doesn't actually get thrown around too much in the school. So but yeah. you could easily get some sort of mystical person going, oh, the chi man. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to end up like one of the YouTube videos of like the... Chi energy self defense, oh, like those yeah. yellow bamboo guys who get tackled oh. by wrestlers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> punch you in the face, smack. <laughs> yeah, we have a really important uh, uh, thing in the school, which is the grounding, and uh, it's almost like uh, the reality check is probably a way better term than grounding because grounding has this like, oh, I just ground my energy. And it's like, I take my shoes no, no, off. No, no, let's let's do a, a real reality check and see if this stuff works. And then you're like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> doesn't work <laughs> so yeah it's it's nice on the flip side we actually have a bunch of tests to show that it's working as well which is a uh, it's kind of like undeniable once you experience it for yourself so it's, it's yeah. uh, no problem like doing stuff with the dog with the guys that was the one that they do- oh, the reason i started with them is because i'd been learning styles of martial arts and i wanted to see if it worked and that was like it's funny when people point at it and go like oh that's not fighting that's just barbaric stuff because they see kind of fanciful stick twirling stuff and I'm like oh that's what that is and then you realise like if someone's actually trying to take your head off <coughs> with a big stick it doesn't really work that way yeah. once you test the reality in that adrenal state it doesn't look fancy it just looks right. simplistic but there's a shit ton of stuff going on in that same thing yeah and a really refined technique inside all that chaos and yeah. some of the better people even though it looks I mean, one of the one of the guys I train with like he's his entire well I have such admiration for the man, but his entire purpose within the Dog Brothers was to prove that his style of Southern Praying Mantis was effective. Mm-hmm. And that's what he did. And I've never seen someone fight so well with a three section staff. Sweet. <laughs> Which is fucking insane to see. Didn't shed out the Thomas Holtman. Mm-hmm. <laughs> nice. And see that guy like fighting with a three section staff and like a Chinese saber style uh, screen mistake. It's just so impressive to watch. Mm-hmm. But then he realize like oh my style has no grappling so he's also a black belt in judo and jiu jitsu so. nice that's the thing you have to yeah change with the times adapt yeah but, uh, no one style is complete it doesn't matter what anyone says it doesn't matter whether it's <laughs> yeah well, obviously Emma's <laughs> yeah and Craig's for internal but yeah, yeah. and Fred's for stretching <laughs> Fred's internal stretching <laughs> it stretches your boundaries it's, it's just also <laughs> a bit of like a it's a bit of an inane idea to find a style that's correct it's like saying that painting is better than drawing and you just go but what but it is what <laughs> and and ov- obviously people could be exceptional like you get a really like masterful painting and compare it to a shitty drawing yeah yeah see painting mm-hmm. better than drawing and you're just like yeah <laughs> i don't know something's not adding up here yeah there's so much that stuff is off of personal of frame of reference yeah it's not like i saw a few shitty drawings so all paintings are better yeah, uh, and uh, I, on the flip side, it's kind of understandable that people get like this because I've got this rule now that I hold that uh, it's basically like 95 to 5 is the ratio of uh, like shitty stuff to good stuff. Mm-hmm. 
and that the five percent are also hanging around each other so you tend to get in these bubbles and i was just a, you know i i hear comments from various people all the time about certain schools of things that you know we were just bagging on yoga not too long ago mm -hmm. but I, I know some yoga guys who have proper legitimate training like uh and it's epically impressive and mm -hmm. and even like removing myself from my own world of the the Taoist arts and if I didn't know about Serge and a few other key teachers that I only found out about because I was in in the right circles they're not really publicly well known then you've just got weird qigong teachers around that are kind of like off their meds a little bit and and so that's your whole point of reference to go well that stuff must all be garbage because i've never met someone who's halfway competent in that particular thing but you never know who's like just not in the public forum and not sharing in, in any any style and i've i've met people from almost every kind of possible style of thing you can think of that's that would like be mind-blowingly good it's really is most of the best teachers i've ever met don't advertise at all what they do they just want to teach they have no interest <laughs> outside of them they're not successful and they're making money that's a good hint when you're looking at coaches on Instagram in general yeah, <laughs> yeah that's true uh, rule of thumb just because like, I do my own social media and I know how long it takes to actually run a good social media account as you can tell my social media account is shit so <laughs> take, take this with a brain of salt if you want <laughs> it takes even longer <laughs> yeah, yeah but the people who, uh, who have like a full time like you know couple posts a day loads of storying loads of comments replying like either they're workaholics or they just don't have any actual clients or students despite what they're saying <laughs> the second if, one is usually more common yeah and if you you know if I look at my workload like you know my online training I have 25 students at any one time it's, that's my max but that's a full time job that's like 30 hours a week nearly looking after them and just dealing with everything whereas most people will just be like oh my students the exact same in martial arts that we were talking the most mm -hmm. like oh, yes this is how you punch like show me your students yeah I kind of I was in uh, a long time ago hanging out in the online worlds of martial arts and mm -hmm. everyone kind of knows everyone and then the thing is in those worlds all the people that are like chatting and whatever amongst themselves about who's good and who's not and whatever they're they're the ones that are constantly arguing with each other for one and they're also the ones that will all actually constantly point to the teachers that are actually good going oh yeah they know the stuff and you can't find anyone who says badly about the good teachers but the te those teachers aren't actually involved in these little arguments <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> at all ever they're, they're just sitting there training because they're, they're totally fine with their stuff and they don't need to jump online and argue about it so, they don't need to prove that they yeah. have the ability that they already have yeah exactly and most of them know each other too, and you can probably ask almost any one of them in the in any given circle who the other good ones are, and they'll just be like, this person, this person, this person, this person, this person. And it'll almost be the same group of people. And I'm sure that, I mean, that's just the world that I know, so I'm sure it applies in any other given yeah. world. As soon as a, like a, em, Emmett's in the circus world, you could probably just rattle off some of the best circus people around, and uh, yeah. almost certainly they're not all over Instagram. And, and things like that. Yeah, that's kind of the thing. Just on that point, is like, I know so many fucking machines of just like physical specimens who can basically do everything tumble, handstands, <coughs> flip, trampoline, aerial, juggle, anything you can have. They can just basically do it at a very high confident level. But you never really hear about them because they just don't give a fuck about it. There's a bit of a counterculture thing in circus as well, mm -hmm. so it's like, yeah, fuck Instagram. Yeah. I just have to be a machine by myself. I really was okay. chatting to Tom Merrick and actually even watching like Judy talk about it um, that like I'm sure all of you guys have had it where you're trying to like do a workout but then also film some of it and the workout itself ends up taking twice as long because yeah. you're just yeah. trying to set up a camera and get the shot right and I don't have that problem because I'm really bad at doing any of that stuff that's fair yeah. <laughs> I'm never filming shit when I work out yeah I think it's like I think we should start filming ourselves yeah probably <laughs> We get more students that way. Oh well. <laughs> Here's my workout. What did I do when I was standing? <laughs> <laughs> Just put on Instagram every single day. Here, Someone posted here that. Here he is again, five. standing. Someone posted that on like, I don't know. Wednesday he's standing again. That'd, That'd be, be a really good, good Instagram profile. Yeah. Just every day you standing still, sped up by a hundred. <laughs> Yeah, someone posted a whole hour of them standing after doing the fighting monkey workshop or something I'd say they go online just like on a big spiel like most difficult thing I've ever done blah 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 I'm just like yeah no <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
You have a squat 300 kilos. <laughs> <laughs> That's easy. Stand your arms up now. That's sure. difficult. <laughs> Put your hands up in the air. Well, it's just like, and then just posing it as like this concept of like, I post for gratitude or I post for like, look at me. It's kind of like, it's a, it's one of those things you probably get with the same high level people. It's just like, no one posts to show off. Mm -hmm. like, even in the movement world, like, you know, it does a bit, but like, he doesn't post that often on super, on social media. Like, even back in the day. Because you could just do the thing. So even like, I've noticed no matter the discipline, some of the most impressive stuff, you'll only understand why it's so impressive when you are deep within it. Yeah. And it's often that's the stuff that doesn't really, the general public is just like, what, like what, why is this so great? Like which I went to the Cirque du Soleil and the handball this guy was going and yeah. I was like, when I was kind of into handstands and training a little bit so I had some idea of how difficult it was. The crowd, the crowd are just clapping at like the basic basic mm -hmm. stuff and like about something flip. insane and i'm like yeah uh, uh, oh oh just sit back down again there's one other person over there <laughs> clapping I'm like, oh, you must try to answer this <laughs> yeah it's kind of the running joke in circus is like a straddle one arm is your easiest one arm mm -hmm. yeah you'll get more clock more more claps and applause for a crocodile you know that el one arm elbow stand mm -hmm. which is basic as fuck than you would like straddle one arm the switch gear or something like that yeah like I was watching, I went to see Circus Play when they were here in Dublin last year, I think it was. And uh, they did, one lady did a routine like on a cargo net that was like spinning from the ceiling. Yeah. And I remember her doing like an iron cross on it and then getting like spun. And I just like, I stood up and just started clapping. I was like, that's fucking insane. And everyone else is just like, huh? what, why, what's so good about this? And then someone would do a backflip and they'd be like, oh, oh God. He's on a backflip. <laughs> do another one. That's kind of the running joke with a lot of like the artists I know in Cirque who do uh, Troop Maison. So Troop Maison is the kind of the non-star performers. But they're still all pretty good, but they do most of the group numbers. And they're all just joking. It's just like, yeah, this is kind of gymnastics I could do when I was age 12 and now I get paid to it. <laughs> Don't do anything hard. It's easy. That's kind of living the dream, right? Yeah, basically. It's just like, it's kind of like, you know, when you perform at 200 shows a year, mm. then you can't operate at, you know, peak operating efficiency every day. But it's just like, yeah, just basically just stroll out of bed and do their acts or do the show. <laughs> it is. I think it's like, once you have an understanding of whatever the craft is, you start to appreciate that high-level performance. Well, it is. I mean, it's even the, the Qigong stuff. Like the, some of the most impressive stuff that you can do is literally like standing still with your arms up. <laughs> Practitioners look at it and go like, most of the the stuff, I mean, even the other stuff that doesn't move, uh, that does move, is just also like the amount of workshop photos I have. That's just a bunch of people looks like they're standing around the room with an like arm in a kind of weird position, and even the video, you know, they're just kind of going like this, and you just don't get any impression about like if you don't know or have never done anything like that, you don't get any impression about what it's <laughs> what it's like to do that and. Uh, and most of the time it's just like it doesn't make for the best social media no unfortunately not in the example I always give to people because it's it's one so close to me is like watching a UFC fight and you see two guys grappling on the ground mm -hmm. and the crowd starts to boo and I'm there like close to the tell you like this is amazing this is the best stuff I've ever seen <laughs> and the fight ends and the crowd's like well, what happened <laughs> you know someone just submits the other guy and they have no idea what they're looking at so they have mm -hmm. no frame of reference to it <laughs> just slowly changing but like yeah, Still, there's a lot of audiences who are just like, oh, ooh, stand up and punch him in the face. Yeah, it's more relatable. Everyone's kind of been punched at some stage in their life, but it's true. the intricacies of like, <laughs> how you put his elbow on the inside or the outside. and Having a joint snapped is not something most people have had the courtesy of getting done. <laughs> well, come over and we can arrange that for you, <laughs> listening in. This is true. I've had one or two. <laughs> just stick, just doing the rounds. Stick. <laughs> Should maybe have the talking stick. <laughs> the talking stick. You just bait the other person with it. To say that. I disagree with your comments. <laughs> Smack. It's a good sturdy stick. It is a good sturdy stick. One of the things I found was pretty nice and funny is in the Dashan school, there's almost zero like communication or talk about training between people. Mm. Like, the beginners were like, -da 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 -da, like chatting, 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 and as soon as you're like a year in, everyone's just like, "Why? What's the talk about? Just do your training." <laughs> it's 
So that's like also the internal practice. Like there's not much frame of reference you can give to someone else. Yeah, and and, and a it's little like bit my body it, feels this way. A little bit it's to do with just like um, having the method method there that works obviously, and then there's not really any questions because there's not so much need for trial and error and exploration besides the stuff that you know about kind of has to happen anyway so it's kind of asking redundant questions that will just get the same answer over and over again which ends up being what happens on forums anyway <laughs> if anyone's but they had the forum 1500 yeah, yeah. years ago and yeah, yeah. Like, it's an archive and yeah yeah it's the right answer <laughs> yeah <laughs> five thousand posts how do i lift more <laughs> I try not posting on the internet. <laughs> try working out. Yeah, the best advice I ever heard about how to get a good back squat is to squat three times a week for ten years. <laughs> best number one method. <laughs> yeah. Could speed that up by t two eight years by squatting every day. <laughs> yeah. right. I know. Another seven years. I know this kid has started the Kit Lockman for those listening has started the squat every day challenge. He's only is it using, weighted? Yeah, it's weighted. He's doing front squats, but only <coughs> and it looks like 60 kg. He hasn't figured out like the max out every day side of things. Uh, okay. Maybe you need to have a word with him. Max out every day would not be fun. It's pretty fun. I done it like two or three years ago. I went like a 140 squat to 180. And 100 front squat to 127 and a half. Were you just doing one hour? Like yeah, just like like basically. Like, you couldn't do an hour? There's basically had max out, so it kind of have a weight. I had a, I had a program, mm -hmm. so it was like alternate front squat and back squat. Mm -hmm. Just max out. If I was feeling fresh in the day, then I'd drop down to maybe 80, 90%, do some doubles and triples for how many mm -hmm. sets to look up board. Anywhere between 3 and 10. Then on the days that the bar was coming up slow, I'd swap the pause squats. So I had to go, okay, I'll pause them and just work on explosivity out of the hole. Mm -hmm. Then once a week I do some remaining deadlifts and leg curls and calves just whenever day I was feeling fresh just to back it out I was doing good like I got the 180 and then the next session or the next back squat session after that so two days later I was fucking using a bar that was it was bent it's just one of the shit bars in the gym that's what we have and uh, yeah I just didn't look at the camera I didn't pay attention when I rack, unracked it I don't know, like 160, 170 or something I was just upside down the way it should have been and as I was coming out of the hole it slipped on one side mm. just ended up like tweaking my back that had me out for a month or two from squatting so it was just like hmm I need to go back to it Fred's been yeah it's basically what I've been doing yeah. how long have you been everyday squatting well it got fucked a little bit from all the travels so the last yeah, yeah but before that I don't know maybe four months four months four months, months and I took it from like it was barely back squatting 140 when I started and I got 170 a few weeks ago nice. yeah. um yeah best like front squat was probably like maybe maybe 110 when I started yeah. and I've done 130 yeah. um, pretty solid yeah That's deadlift good. I haven't really done so I'm still at 220 yeah. That's, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're not pounds good <laughs> we're so strong use the metric system yeah so it's kind of like just I chose to do that just because like my deadlift was way out of whack compared to yeah. like I could I could deadlift two twenty but I could just about back squat one fifty. I'm the same. I can like so some of it has to do with like leverages and we both have like yeah, long arms. Long so long yeah, I can I can start my deadlift way out of the hole. Yeah. So it's just like just pop the hips and it up. So especially if I go sumo, so it's so much cheating did you not get that memo same <laughs> yeah. so with knee sleeves and belts <laughs> no I don't it's the only way to do it yeah like I can comfortably back squat like 100 which isn't really good I can get up to 120 but like my deadlift is like 180 plus it's just like yeah. I just hate squatting <laughs> yeah fair enough there's a certain amount that looks like Duration under the bar that you have to do to yeah, get a squat yeah. up, you just have the leg strength. Yeah, but then it's also like, why do you train? This is the kind of thing you're training for a big squat or big legs. Obviously, you should be squatting, maybe not in the big leg case, but blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. Probably just lost some internet points there. 
but yeah. it's like you know, fight you know most of your fight like most of your training is for fighting and other stuff yeah. so it's true I mean like I've had more fun and benefit from just doing like weird bodyweight squats because to be honest the times where my legs are going to be in trouble is when they're getting twisted in a weird direction that they shouldn't be someone yeah. needs to do stance training yeah buddy <laughs> your buddy how much did you deadlift the other week uh, I did uh, it was about bodyweight and a half on my first go um, one thirty. Mm-hmm. Did you want to go higher or was the Dave went higher? Dave was going much higher, but yeah. uh, the, like the it kind of wasn't anywhere near maxed out. Besides, like heading to the the chain wasn't maxed out, there, but there was like a couple of weak points that yeah, could have just been built up and it, just it, it a technique felt, tweaks, huh? yeah, it was a technique thing in a couple of weeks to to make it higher and yeah. feel like unachievable. So every so uh, let's just put that in context. So how much deadlifting have you done throughout? Zero. Yeah. So. <laughs> A one thirty deadlift that's whatever seventy five eighty yeah, kg body 80, weight eighty probably eighty kg body weight with no deadlifting and uh, uh, cool the stance the, f- the front squat was one fifteen and I could have gone more I just didn't want to really push it on the first go yeah I like uh, I went down and up real clean on one fifteen it didn't even wobble but uh, I just chose not to go on yeah there's a lot of people out there who probably suffered a lot with forty kg on the front squat and working it up. Mm-hmm. I think the only time I did back squat, which is one time in the gym, because my friends were doing it and they came over to see what they were doing, I think I did do a set of five or ten of a hundred and then put a hundred and twenty on and put it up a few times and got bored and yeah. did something else. So I didn't really see what the max of that was. It would be interesting just like just to have the numbers. I'm kind of like it's, like it's in the back of my mind to train that stuff for three months at some point and. Yeah. just see what happens it's one of those ones like if you could deadlift twice a week just, just to work on technique yeah. don't even like I wouldn't even think about maxing out just get the technique smooth mm-hmm. with like 80kg and then just max out and just see what happens yeah it's something good would almost certainly happen and uh, it's in the back of my mind the problem is I don't like it enough to actually rearrange my week to do it so then it just has to be, <laughs> it just, it just has to be like walking oh uh, deadlift is pre-prepared for me here at the, in my the bar right inside your house are you God, still at the barbell yes. in your carport yeah yeah the, the barbell's in my spare room actually at the moment and uh I, but it's only got 40 kg on it and i don't know about dropping large weights on the third story drop so, it, just, just so uh, I, i've been uh military press and bicep curling that as i walk past and feel like it for rounds of however the many hell i feel like this is the training i do yes. highly yeah. highly programmed <laughs> oh, <girl. laughs> um yeah, that's that's been feeling nice. The military press, especially the overhead pressing, was kind of a weak weak point for a bit, and now it's feeling yeah. strong. Cool. It's funny. Every uh, parkour guy <coughs> who I've taught mm. to lift, like initially, has lifted at least a whole body weight for reps, just like from never having deadlifted. Yeah. It's which a thing. Yeah. I love because like they did. I love pointing at those guys because it's such a contradiction to like what sports science says. It's like, oh, you must do this amount before you can safely do plyometrics. It's like that's all they do. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of. I think there's a lot of. If you go back to the roots of sports science and what we start thinking and what they're monitoring, it's just like they're not observing the reality of the situation involving the athletes. And you get this in track and field, you get this in everything. I remember like bringing one of the girls from circus school to lift for the first time. And she was like 50, 50 kg, 52, something like this, 5 foot, 150 cm. I think she sumo deadlifted like about 100 kg. Just, just first time for reps, for sets of five. You know, obviously she's five foot, she doesn't have to lift the bar that high, but yeah. it's still just like, you know, what was her training up to that date? Occasionally your coach would come in and go, oh, do 20 squats, do 20 step ups, do this, do a circuit, and then the rest was just fucking jumping. So what had the bigger effect? Dot, dot, dot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, it must have been like those 20 step ups before <laughs> <shit> <laughs> technique that were kindly strung in haphazardly around the week, depending if the coach wants to punish you or not. It's all the guard training. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely, it's all about the guap. It was, um, yeah, it's a little mad. <laughs> <laughs> had a good point, Scott. Um, yeah, I think it's a good point to wrap up. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for meeting, guys. Absolute pleasure having you on. No problem. We gotta go play board games, so. <laughs> Settlers of Guatan. Uh, <laughs> all right. Thanks, everybody, for listening. If you did, please. Peace.